Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're taking a look at where the enterprise tech world is heading in 2022, from cloud to edge computing. We'll talk about digital transformation and the democratization of technology, some big uh, heavy terms. In short, we're taking a deep dive into the future. To provide insight into all that, I'm joined by a very special guest. With me is Adam Burden, who leads Accenture Technology in North America. He's the chief software engineer at Accenture. Adam, very good to have you with us today. Great to be here. Thanks, James, so much. And, uh, you know, it is that time of, of year for predictions and the holidays. So happy holidays. And I'm pleased to have a chance to talk to you about where we think things are heading. And, and by the way, I do absolutely love your sweater there today. It feels very festive and very holiday. Well, I didn't win the ugly sweater contest, but I really <laughs> tried hard, as you can tell by the quality of this one. <laughs> Never would have guessed it. No. All right. So. Uh, you've made some really interesting predictions, I think, for the upcoming year. Here's here's one of them. Uh, you say, quote, cloud will continue its dominance, which, of course, I think we, we get that one, which means that managing and optimizing hybrid cloud environments will be front and center, as well as charting the right strategy around using cloud to accelerate 5G and edge deployments, end of yeah. quote. That's really fascinating. So you're, you're tying in cloud and edge and, and also 5G. How, how does that work for you? Well, first, we, we really do feel strongly that these um, uh, technology disruptors are going to uh, amplify each other. In fact, so much so we put them inside of our same cloud first practice uh, because we think there's a lot of synergies to be gained uh, in the way that uh, edge deployments are, gonna, are going to take place in the future. Uh, from what we have learned uh, that has occurred and taken place in cloud. Uh, and I, I do want to underscore that the cloud will remain a very dominant um, uh, element of so many uh, technology strategies heading into next year. But we believe that this is finally the year, I think we've been saying this for a while, but this is really finally the year where edge is really going to take off. Uh, we think that the maturity of the technologies there, uh, the demand uh, is, is picking up quite significantly. Uh, and we also believe that there's been a lot of innovations in this space uh, introductions, you know, of, of newer releases from like the Google Anthos uh, solution uh, or what's happened in other areas, which is really bringing this to, to prominence and making edge quite real. Uh, and whether that's on the factory floor or if it's in autonomous vehicles or otherwise, uh, we think there's going to be this great explosion of edge demand the coming year, not to mention you've got this other effect of 5G out there, which is going to further enable people to take advantage of edge even faster. Just take a look at some of the announcements that AWS made at reInvent just a few weeks ago around mm -hmm. what they're doing to bring private edge out and newer advances that they've got in edge as well. Uh, it's pretty obvious this is going to be a big year for edge ahead, and we think it's only going to be amplified by what's happened with cloud. Hmm. You know, it's interesting about 5G. I always hear 5G. It's always, you know, on the way, on the way, on the way. So are you thinking that it's kind of like cold fusion, isn't it? It's cold fusion. I think it, I think cold fusion is actually even further out than five G, if possible. Uh, but um, are you thinking five G is going to be more than vaporware in the year twenty twenty two? Yeah, we are. Uh, you know, there. Look, the um, uh, first of all, I think that the what the carriers have done to begin deploying the technology has really accelerated things. The thing that's been I think really interesting is some of the partnerships that are happening between um, what I'll call new entrants in the carrier field, like AWS, for example. Um, part, private companies are setting up kind of their own private G, 5G uh, infrastructure, as well as um, the adoption in devices and technology of being able to use 5G. And I, I think that those things um, really have started to uh, encourage and further the adoption of it. And we believe as well, based upon the, the current coverage areas that are out there and the ever expanding approach of this, that this is also something that's really gonna make an impact in the, in the coming year. And it's something to keep your eye on too, you know, about both backwards compatibility with other uh, communications technology and being able to really embrace what 5G uh, is gonna be able to do. You know, the difference in latency with 5G is the thing that I think is, is really going to unlock a lot of the value of edge. You think about something like um, you know, having uh, autonomous vehicles or other things where real-time control or near real-time control is, is absolutely paramount. 5G gives you that, especially with huge volumes of data. And that's why we believe it's really going to be an accelerator. Interesting. Uh, your next uh, bold prediction is called Across the Business. 
You say the democratization of technology is encouraging the yeah. decentralization of the IT workforce. As non-technical employees gain the tools to build their own solutions, some of the burden is removed from IT. This means that IT can work more hand in hand with business uh, departments to build solutions that are aligned with specific needs and goals. You know, I think one of the most fascinating ideas is the democratization of technology. It feels like that trend is being underreported. In short, it's this ability for, for non-technical staffers to do more and more with technology. That's a big, big trend with what's going on today. Agree, disagree? I know you must agree. Really agree. I've written and talked about the, the this area for quite a while. Uh, and I believe that uh, yeah, the, the um, enablement of business users uh, to perform their own technology uh, tasks and services, especially being able to build their own apps to a degree, is the, is the step that's really going to get us across the finish line with enabling the business. Um, and uh, I think that there's quite a bit of momentum out there in this space. Uh, I, um, I wrote a blog not too long ago um, that uh, started off with the line, and it was from one of my favorite movies. It was uh, this um, movie called Ratatouille, where mm -hmm. there's a chef in it, and he says, everybody can cook. Um, I like to say everybody can code. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really believe that um, if you if you uh, put the business users and enable them with these low code, no code tools in the right way, you're going to be amazed at the solutions and innovations that they, that they create. Uh, and we're at such an interesting period right now in this democratization of technology, this enablement of the business to do even more. And I, I really believe, and Accenture does as well, that this is really just one of these other major changes that happens as all businesses become more digital businesses. Uh, because the truly digital enterprise would need technical skills in every facet of their organization. And now you're seeing them being enabled. And let's not make no mistake too, in many cases, this is happening out of necessity. I mean, the mm -hmm. scarcity of, of IT skills that are out there, it's, it's no mistake, right? Where this is something where it's very real and difficult to find uh, very high-end skills. So uh, being able to take um, you know, folks that have uh, business acumen or expertise in a process technology or perhaps in a uh, manufacturing area or otherwise and enabling them with these types of tools, it's going to unleash new areas of innovation. And, and this democratization of technology is exactly what we need at the right time to be able to do that. You know, I think definitely with low code, no code, we're at an inflection point. It's that's headed sort of, a, it feels like hockey stick exponential growth in, in the yeah. years ahead. I mean, the, the one thing I've heard uh, some, a quibble about low code, no code is that, hey, it is great, but think about the cybersecurity, you know, problem, oh, potential yeah. cybersecurity. I mean, that that's that's that create really opens up a Pandora's box. Does it though? Um, I, I think it does if if you do it sort of in an unbridled way. Um, but the way that we look at it is, is that you want to you want to uh, create almost like bumper car uh, like apparatuses around uh, your low code, no code environments and even uh, to to a degree, create almost tiering uh, of different types of users of low, low code, no code solutions. And we think that through that, you can mitigate against a lot of the uh, cybersecurity risks that might be out there. So for example, you might have a level one, which is for people with really no formal training in software development or otherwise. And, and really, you know, some of the restrictions in there are, um, yeah, uh, maybe they're not permitted to write directly to like a relational database um, or um, the apps that they build um, have to comply fully with the authentication uh, and single sign-on capability of the enterprise. Um, and then, you know, so that would be for like the true, like, we'll call the, uh, the level one brand new kind of uh, into software development. And then if people get more advanced, they can actually graduate to other tiers and get more freedom. Um, we think there's a balance here though, James, to be, to be clear, like mm -hmm. um, if you put too many restrictions on that, exactly what you want to achieve with this unleashing of innovation and other things is, is going to be compressed, right? So we don't want to do that. What we want to do is to create something with almost bumper cars around it. So people can have fun, but they're not going to get hurt and they're not mm -hmm. going to cause problems with uh, cybersecurity around it. And that's what it should be about is about unleashing that creativity and the um, enabling people who have not traditionally been able to build applications to do exactly that. You think we've come up with the right solution to exactly how to solve that and address some of those concerns. Hmm. 
All right. So your, your next big prediction is called In the Classroom. Yeah. Uh, and you say, uh, I, like, I like this one. With, yeah. with a constant shortage of tech talent, more emphasis is needed on worker upskilling and collaboration. For instance, Accenture invested $900 million for employees to complete 31 million hours of training in tech and business topics. Organizations will need to first define the roles of the future and then prepare their IT workforce. It's sort of it actually it also relates to the democratization of technology a bit here. What's your take on this one? Yeah, I you look, um, uh, I think that any organization these days who's taking a look at the labor market sort of recognizes that they, they can't just be a recruiter of technology talent. They have to be a creator of talent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what are they going to do to cooperate and collaborate to reach further down into the talent generation networks and make sure that they're, they're encouraging building talent and capabilities which are aligned uh, with what their future needs are anticipated to be. Yes, you have to pull out the crystal ball a little bit, but in, in that tradition, that's what this session is all about, right? Talking about what the future is. So right. think about it. You know, are there uh, partnerships with universities or even high schools? We're, by the way, doing some of that with high schools even to bring students into our organization, into our offices early as possible to start getting them thinking about careers in this space. Um, and with colleges and universities, you know, for example, we're working with one right now around uh, data science, um, mm -hmm. where we're collaborating with senior projects in the data science space to be able to um, talk to them about, um, have, you, have you thought about how to solve these kinds of problems using uh, R um, or data acquisition technology or dealing with um, uh, challenges in data quality? And that really gets them sort of excited and interested in what a career in this space could be. And that's why we really need to invest in this. And it's not just for our own employees. We, yes, we invest a lot of, um, of, uh, of our market development investment dollars every year in making sure that our people have the most current uh, skills. But I also think we have to reach beyond that into the future generation of recruits and make sure that we're building the talent that we want to be there. And we're starting to attract them to our company as well. We think other organizations really should be doing something similar uh, because we have to be talent creators. There's just not enough out there uh, to go around. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you're in college now and your and your major is data science or, or a related field, <laughs> you, you will not have any trouble finding work. That's I, no, I feel you're not going to have that. much trouble finding a, finding opportunities. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, your your last one here is is neat. You, you call it on a, on a platform, and it goes like this: Companies are growing and converging by building platforms that other companies can use to provide complementary services. These network effect platforms often create new business models and strengthen strategic partnerships, all with considerably less investment. Uh, describe the platforms you're talking about. Yeah, this is a this this area of the platform space. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of reminded by that adage of you know we sort of underestimate uh, the time frame in which disruptive technologies will become important, and then and then really, uh, well, rather we overestimate the time frame in which they come in, and then underestimate the impact. Um, mm. Several years ago, there was a great uh, book that was published. I'm sure you're familiar with it around platform revolution uh, that really talked about these things. Um, and uh, I think right now we're on the precipice of an explosion uh, in, in the platform space. We see our customers really thinking differently uh, about how they want to present to their uh, digital um, uh, uh, customers and business partners and even employees out there. And they're finding that like things from the network effect of a platform can really benefit them. It, it allows them to expand into adjacent industries and to receive new growth that was unexpected. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to uh, protect against risks in their future. Um, I, I'm, I recall one client in particular who's embarking on a journey and, and many others, but one in particular was in the insurance industry, very concerned about the way that um, automotive was beginning to bundle insurance into, uh, into cars. So you would almost buy cars as a service. And they were concerned, like, how does this create from a, like a disintermediation effect? And what does this impact to our business as a result? So what they embarked on was a more full-featured platform solution 
to engage better with their customers, introduce them to new financial products and services, new insurance uh, solutions and other things. So at the time, you know, that perhaps, you know, we do all start buying cars as a service and maybe that's in the future. That's not a prediction I'm going to make today, though. <laughs> well, I'd say, uh, I think it, it may be coming, but yeah, anyways. It, it could be coming, but they're well insulated against it because you know what? They've created a genuine network effect. They've invited others onto that platform. They're benefiting from distribution power law and the other benefits that we all talked about and believed in when, when Platform Revolution was, was released. And we said, oh, this is tomorrow. Well, it turns out it was a few years later, but the impact has much bigger than I think we ever imagined. Uh, and we believe, and we're seeing today, a lot of clients out there who are investing even further in these platforms, whether it's to create their own or to join a platform with full force because they see the benefit and really believe in it for the future. Well, let me clarify. If you give maybe another example of a platform, I, I understand the, the cars and bundling insurance sure. with, with the sales of the cars, but what's another example of a company, I don't know if you, maybe you can name a name, if not, that's okay, of, of a company sure. building a platform with, with this idea in mind. Yeah, so there's quite a few out there that are doing things like this. So another one is um, one that, that kind of looks at like um, academic achievements uh, of, of students. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a long time, they're quite, um, you know, it was involved in their primary purpose was around measuring that academic achievement but never really got into the, hey, what about um, a tutoring? Or what about the analytics that we could run around um, uh, students and look at correlations between the type of course load they took and their future success or their likelihood to get into a college or other things which mm -hmm. people would be interested in consuming that? What about the identity of all of the students that have used that particular platform and they've been authenticated? How can we actually create new opportunities for revenue and service on that? I mean, mm. the possibilities really are unbounded when you open up your thinking to what if we were truly a platform business, we bring others onto this platform, we benefit from network effect and from the other things that are there. And I don't think this is right, by the way, for every business to be clear, but I think at least every business should be part of a platform ecosystem. And for some of them, they have an opportunity to create their own and create their own network effect as a result. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Adam, I think you said it. I mean, 2022 should be an interesting year at the very least. I, I hope it is only interesting. Uh, maybe that's be my, my one optimistic thought. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Please only be interesting. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So perhaps we will talk a year from now. Uh, at any rate, have yourself a great holiday and, uh, and, and a great new year. I'd like that, James. Same back to you. Take care.